Honourable Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture, Zizi Godwa, Gauteng Premier, Mr. Panyaza Lusufi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Nelson Mandela Foundation Board of Trustees, the Acting CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Vern Harris, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. My name is Nigiwe Bigicha, and we're so delighted that you could join us today. It is so wonderful to be back at the Nelson Mandela Theatre, which was the venue of the inaugural annual lecture in 2003, delivered by former US President Bill Clinton. Since then, ladies and gentlemen, the annual lecture has grown from strength to strength as a sought after platform for thought leadership, reflection and debate on significant social issues. The Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture has been held around the country and more recently beyond our borders in New York and The Hague, further cementing Madiba's legacy as a man of the people and a global icon. We are therefore so delighted this year and honored that activists and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Malala Yousafzai accepted our invitation to be the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture Speaker here in Johannesburg, where it all began. <laughs> this year's lecture sees a different format from what we've seen in the past. After delivering her remarks, our speaker this year will lead and moderate a discussion with an esteemed panel which will delve deeper into some of the issues that she will raise. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today, of course, is a significant date on our calendar. Significant and poignant, as it marks 10 years since we lost our founder, Madiba, on the 5th of December in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to now ask all of us to rise as we observe a moment's silence in his memory. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I'm sure you'll agree with me then. It is therefore fitting, as we mark the 10th anniversary since Madiba's passing, that we take a hard look at ourselves and the state of the world we live in. It is a moment of polycrises and conflicts and begs for us all to revive the values of Madiba who lived a life in pursuit of justice, freedom, equality, and peace. As many of you will agree, we are far from that place. So the theme for this year's Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture is leading for a just future. To further elucidate on that theme and to introduce this year's speaker, Please welcome the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Njabulo Ndebele. Good afternoon to everyone uh, in the hall and uh, beyond here in the theatre, our od television audiences around uh, the country. And I welcome you on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and uh, delighted that we are back in this theater as you heard where the first uh, lecture 
was given by uh, President uh, uh, Bill Clinton. Now, uh, so that is a history worth retelling uh, today. And uh, many who have attended previous lectures will recall following the pictorial history of uh, our speakers on Yoma, we'd have some walls, on the walls, all these pictures that tell the story of their sequencing. And you would have all gone all the way up from the beginning to the end to our latest speaker and will have confirmed by the largest margin that she was definitely not among the oldest of them. So Malala, we are honored uh, to welcome you to the precious piece of South Africa uh, this afternoon. And we welcome your father and your husband who are traveling with you. And Mrs. Michelle and members of the Mandiba family, we always appreciate year after year the sense of continuity your presence brings to the ambience and character of my Diba's lecture. I welcome you once more. Thank you. And finally, allow me to welcome a fellow Board of Trustees, members of the, of the Foundation, whose uh, reward for serving Madiba's Foundation is only the satisfaction they derive from the selfless giving of their intellects, their integrity, their sensibilities, dedication, energy, and time to being a vital part of keeping alive and honoring Madiba's legacy. That legacy continues to inspire the global imagination and shape the hopes of people, billions around the world. We are truly grateful to your contributions. For each lecture, we invite globally influential figures to address the critical issues facing our world. We endeavor through the lecture to promote dialogue on those issues, keeping them alive in the public imagination and through the sense of urgency that's generated at each time, inspire action for lasting impact. Madiba's commitment to social justice, equity, robust reconciliation, and human rights are the load stars that give direction to all the work that we do. This year, we commemorate, as you have heard, 10 years of uh, Madiba's passing. And after a decade with him, we confess to continue to miss him dearly. We miss his astute and profound leadership. We miss how deeply he loved all the people of South Africa and touched so many around the world. And we miss the promise and symbol of freedom and unity that he represented. And above all, we miss how whenever we listened to him, we took in, which he gave to us, the voice of conviction, of genuineness, of honesty, of credibility, and immense integrity. His words and voice always conveyed the depth of honesty and the real sense of the truth behind it. Madiba spoke to engage our understanding, 
I think this was because of his attitude towards language. He once said about language, and I quote, without language, one cannot talk to people and understand them. One cannot share their hopes and aspirations, grasp their history, appreciate their poetry, and savor their songs, end of quote. Language was then for Madiba a living social tool for building community. For these reasons, he took care to learn the language, took care to speak it well, and to hear it spoken by others he listened to when they spoke back at him. And so he would want to speak, we would want to hear. Speaking to him never came across as a calculated trade-off such as, give me this and I will give you that. He spoke to people because interaction with them through language was always an opportunity for mutual discovery, for building and expanding community. That is why language and language spoken well were very important to him. We can encapsulate the significance of every speech moment for him. What you say is who you are. How you say it is who you are. And how you are heard to be saying what you say is who you are. Today, our world sees many leaders who stand on global stages where the entire world is looking and listening to them. We, we be it in the United Nations, in parliament, in political rallies as they speak, you can tell that many do not believe any of the words they utter. They cannot be trusted on the understandings and undertakings and assurances they promise. And you can tell also that their listeners do not believe a word of what they are saying. But in the manner of the trade, they plod on performing conviction, which is reflected neither in their words, nor in their faces, nor in the visible language of the bodies when they speak. And this is how, if you look carefully around, powerful doubts, suspicion, mistrust, animosity is spread throughout our nations, throughout our countries, and around the world. And everywhere one goes, not only in South Africa, but also around the world, and for a variety of reasons, there is a deep anxiety over the future of the world. The international rule of law is particularly under attack. Global governance institutions such as the United Nations are routinely undermined by powerful nations who willfully ignore and undermine international law because they can. Or in individual countries, powerful leaders flout the rule of law because they can. Such are the concerns that led us to the theme of today's lecture, leading for a just future. To help us ponder this theme is Malala Yousafzai, our speaker for the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Malala is a Pakistani female education activist and the 2014 Nobel Peace Prize laureate at the age of 17. <laughs> and by far the world's youngest Nobel Prize laureate and the second Pakistani and the first Pashtun to receive a Nobel Prize. 
She's a human rights advocate for the education of women and children in her native land. Swat is, the, is where she comes from, where girls were at times banned attending school. I cannot, I, I'm, I'm compelled to remember at this moment, as I mentioned, her contributions and advocacy on behalf of children and, and young women to urge us to remember at this very moment the children of Palestine. <clears throat> Her advocacy has grown into an international movement and according to former Prime Minister Shahid Abbasi, she has become Pakistan's most prominent citizen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Malala to the podium. Rahim. Good afternoon, everyone. Distinguished guests, Professor Andy Bailey and the Nelson Mandela Foundation team, it is an honor to be here. This is my first visit to South Africa, and you have made it very special. Grasa Mashal. Grasa Mashal, it is a particular honor to be with you. Thank you for fighting for girls and women everywhere and for always championing the voices of young people. Thank you to everyone here with me today and all those listening online from around the world. And thank you to the activists and experts who will be joining us in conversation after my speech. I know I'm here to give a lecture, but you all know me. I will always be a student first. It is as students that we first open our eyes to injustice. It is as students that we first ask difficult questions about the world. It is as students that we first find friends who embolden us to speak out. So when I thought about what I want to share with you today and what it means to lead for a just future, I approached this assignment not as a lecturer, but as a student. With Mandela's legacy in mind, I asked myself, what injustice is the world overlooking? Where are we allowing inhumanity to become the status quo? The answer for me was very clear and very personal. The oppression of girls and women in Afghanistan. My family and I know what it feels like to live under the Taliban ideology. At 11, I was banned from school. At 15, I was shot and nearly killed for standing up for my right to receive an education. We were always looking over our shoulders. Nelson Mandela and his fellows, South Africans, knew that feeling well. And their resilience and collective action in the face of injustice can inspire us. Just two years ago, women in Afghanistan were working, serving in leadership positions, running ministries, traveling freely. Girls of all ages were playing soccer and cricket and learning in schools. Though all was not perfect, there was progress. 
And fundamentally, girls and women had opportunities. They had choice. They had agency. Then the Taliban seized power a second time. As they did in the 1990s, they quickly began the systematic oppression of girls and women. For a short time, this made headlines. But since then, the world has turned its back on the Afghan people. Maybe this reflects the sheer number of crises the world is facing. Violence and displacement in Sudan, famine in Yemen, the climate crisis being debated right now at COP28, war in Ukraine, and of course, the unjust bombardment of Gaza, where a child is killed every 10 minutes. So much of humanity is wounded. But we cannot allow ourselves to buy into this false notion that we can only care about one crisis at a time. We must be able to hold space for suffering wherever it is happening in the world. So today, I would like to bring attention back to the girls of Afghanistan whose suffering has been sidelined. Our first imperative is to call the regime in Afghanistan what it really is. It is a gender apartheid. We know that gender-based discrimination exists in every country. Gender-based persecution exists in many countries. But gender apartheid is different. Apartheid is a system that is, imposed, that is imposed and enforced by those in power. The very people who are supposed to protect their citizens. In South Africa, defenders of such a system insisted that it was somehow the natural order of things to segregate whites from non-whites. Similarly, in Afghanistan, the Taliban say that oppressing girls and women is a matter of religion. So let me say this as plainly as possible. That is only an excuse, but it is also not true. Many Muslim scholars, including from Afghanistan, have made clear that Islam does not condone denying girls and women their right to education and to work. But the Taliban are not interested in the truth. They are interested in maintaining power. And they will use any excuse from culture to security to justify their actions. In the name of their false vision, they have introduced more than 80 decrees and edicts restricting girls' and women's rights. If you are a girl in Afghanistan, the Taliban has decided your future for you. You cannot attend a secondary school or university. You cannot find an open library where you can read. You see your mothers and your older sisters confined and constrained in a similar way. They cannot leave the house on their own, not to work, not to go to the park, not to get a haircut, not to even see a doctor. And the punishment for doing these very ordinary everyday things is severe. Indefinite detention, forced marriage, beating, death. In effect, the Taliban have made girlhood illegal. And it is taking a toll. Girls kept out of school are experiencing depression and anxiety. Some are turning to narcotics, attempting suicide. No girl anywhere in the world should have to suffer this way. If we, as a global community, accept the Taliban's edicts, we are sending a devastating message to girls everywhere that they are less human, that your rights are up for debate, 
that we are willing to look away. There is another reason to call this gender apartheid. Apartheid is more than just a description. It is a legal concept. South Africans fought for racial apartheid to be recognized and criminalized at the international level. In the process, they drew more of the world's attentions to the, world, to the horrors of apartheid. More people joined the anti-apartheid campaign driving political and cultural change. By defining systemic oppression in legal terms, they named it and made it easier to enlist allies against it. But gender apartheid has not been explicitly codified yet. That is why I call on every government in every country to make gender apartheid a crime against humanity. We have an opportunity to do that right now. The UN is currently drafting and debating a new Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. This is the moment for world leaders to stand with Afghan girls and women, adding and adapting language on gender apartheid to the treaty will codify it under the international law. Member states like South Africa can play an important role in championing this cause. This legal approach might seem disconnected from everyday lives and human suffering, but the international law is not an abstraction. It is a practical tool. It is a way to protect the oppressed. It is a way to hold the Taliban to account and to hold anyone who helps them legally complicit. And as we saw with South Africa, it can spur and strengthen collective action. In these ways, codification will help prevent gender apartheid from happening elsewhere. It will send a strong message of support to the girls and women of Afghanistan who have been demanding this that we hear them, that we will not let them fight alone. I want you to know about Hanifa, a 16-year-old girl from northern Afghanistan. When the Taliban pushed girls out of secondary school, Hanifa was stuck at home, feeling like the walls were closing in. She took matters into her own hands, gathered her friends and their sisters in her living room to teach them English and maths in secret. I want you to know about Zarka Yaftali, a researcher and human rights advocate. Three years ago, Zarka warned the UN that if the Taliban returned, girls and women's rights would be crushed. Zarka's worst fear were confirmed, and she was forced into exile. But she is not giving up. She is helping build the case for codifying gender apartheid. It is time for all of us to stand with her. Hanifa and Zarka are two of many Afghans rising up, as Madiba did, against injustice. But they cannot do this alone, nor should they have to. As we press to make gender apartheid a crime against humanity, there's more we can do now. First, International actors must resist normalizing relations with the Taliban. This includes governments, conference organizers, and UN officials engaging with the Taliban as if they were just another partner. This also means companies seeking to make business deals with them. Those who prioritize political or financial gains over human rights are condoning, are condoning gender apartheid. If we want to send a clear signal that the world stands against apartheid, we cannot allow any cracks in our resolve. 
This is important because despite appearances, the Taliban are not immune to international pressure. Last spring, they unjustly detained Matiullah Besa, a champion for girls' education. But activists in Afghanistan and around the world rallied for his case, and eventually he was released. If it weren't for the international pressure, we may never have seen him again. Second, we must find and create ways to bring education to Afghan girls at home. Afghan organizations and international partners are already piloting digital learning platforms, science and maths lessons on TV and radio, and interactive lectures via SMS and social media. We need philanthropists and institutions to fund these innovations, which is the only way that Afghan girls are going to learn while they are banned from going to school. Finally, we must build a global movement against gender apartheid. Student groups, feminist campaigners, religious leaders, and other human rights activists have a big role to play in building public pressure. As the South African scholar Penny Andrews told me in a recent conversation, student activism was the heartbeat of the anti-apartheid movement. I was reminded of it on my visit to the Apartheid Museum this week, when I saw the images of the 1976 Soweto uprising. It was in response to that brutality that young people around the world spoke out in solidarity with their fellow students to pressure individuals and institutions to take action. Now, as then, Students and activists everywhere must spread the word about atrocities happening in Afghanistan and make this cause their own. It took a bullet to my head for the world to stand with me. What will it take for the world to stand with the girls and women of Afghanistan. To anyone who says they care about protecting girls and women, to anyone who says they care about education, to anyone who says they care about oppression, what are you waiting for? The case could not be clearer. Right now, millions of Afghan girls are effectively imprisoned but they fight on, calling for justice, calling for the world to stand with them. They are the heroes the history books can teach us about. We must be their champions until they're free. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture Speaker, Ms. Malala Yousafzai. Thank you for what has undoubtedly been a very evocative and powerful clarion call for us not to look away, for us to cast our eyes firmly on what's happening in Afghanistan and for the global community to play its role in ensuring that gender apartheid is declared a crime against humanity. We promise, Malala, we will not look away again. Thank you so much. As I indicated in the beginning, our speaker wishes to take the conversation further. We're delighted with this approach, Malala, and thank you so much for suggesting it to us. Allow me now to introduce the esteemed panel that is going to take the conversation further, led and moderated by our speaker. 
Our first panelist scarcely needs introduction. Mum Grasa Michelle is the founder of the Grasa Michelle Trust. She's a leading African stateswoman and renowned global leader whose decades-long professional and public life is rooted in the struggle for freedom and justice, with a particular focus on Southern Africa, but globally as well, and her work in international advocacy for women and children's rights. Mam Grasa Michelle, please give a warm round of applause. Allow me now to introduce our other speakers who've traveled far to be here with us today. Metra Mehran is an Afghan human rights activist and academic whose work is focused on women's empowerment, gender equality, peace, and development. Please give a warm welcome to Metra Mehran. We're also delighted this afternoon to welcome Karima Benun. She's a professor of law at the University of Michigan. She specializes in public international law and international human rights law, but has had a particular focus over the past few years addressing the UN Security Council about gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Please welcome Karima Benun. Our final panelists this afternoon, Nombendulom Nombe Kachwa is the youngest woman on the benches of the ANC in the National Assembly of the South African Parliament. She serves as the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Higher Education, Science and Technology. She's also, of course, as we know, a highly regarded activist and advocate for access to education. Please give a warm round of applause for Nombendulom Kachwa. Over to you. Thank you so much to everyone for your time today. And I would like to give a special thanks to all the speakers on the stage for agreeing to speak more about the topics I touched. I think it's really critical that we ground any conversation about Afghanistan by first hearing from an Afghan woman. Mitra, I'm hoping you can paint a picture for all of us, what life looked like growing up in Afghanistan and what life looks like right now for women in Afghanistan. Um, thank you so much. Uh, first, um, I am filled with gratitude sitting with you, an incredible woman um, here, um, gathering for our cause to leverage this prestigious space in a stage um, to shine light on atrocities in Afghanistan and gender apartheid in Afghanistan. And it is such a humbling experience um, to echo on visions of Nelson Mandela to talk about gender apartheid in my own country. Um, to give some context, let me take you back to 14th of August 2021, a day before Taliban's takeover. I woke up walk on the same street of our shared home with millions of girls going to school and hundreds of thousands of women going to university and work. I went to work. After work, I went to my friends that we worked on Feminine Perspectives campaign to amplify voices of women in the peace negotiation processes. Um, just a normal day, a normal human being. But life was not, not that easy. My life was, my name was on a list, number six on that list, to be killed by the Taliban, so the name of many of my friends. I woke up every day um, listening and hearing about the death of my friends, my colleagues, and the people I knew and admired. Taliban attacked our house where I lost two family members. And on ad another attack, they killed my cousin, whom I share so many cherished memories. Every day when, I, when we got out of our house, we were not sure if we are getting back home in the evening. Everyone was a target to the Taliban. But there was system, there was law that we had hope. And we were trying together, 
millions of women in Afghanistan to take things forward. August and no one was safe from the suicide bombs and explosions of the Taliban. August 15, the nightmare came true. Taliban take over Kabul and the government as a result of a negotiation process led by international community, mainly the United States government, and the people who are suffering the consequences in Afghanistan now, especially women, were not part of it. Now I'm sitting here in exile, and, and that same terrorist group is controlling Afghanistan. As you said too, if a woman is hungry, she cannot walk legally to a grocery store alone. If she is sick, she cannot go to a hospital to seek medical support because every single basic human rights is legally banned practicing it, that legally banned for women. Afghanistan is basically an open prison for everyone. And what's happening in Afghanistan, women bravely are resisting it. Women are on the streets facing gunshots, arbitrary arrest, torture, and death. Many of those women were killed and their bodies were thrown on the street, so it worked as a deterrence to others. Yes, maybe violence is everywhere, but as I am talking here, currently Julia Parsi, I want to name them, Nida Parwani, Manija Siddiqui, Parisa Azada, Bahara Karimi, and countless other women that we do know about only because of protesting and resisting for their basic human rights are imprisoned. Sixteen of women who were imprisoned last year under torture, they were forced to give confession videos saying me and two other women encouraged them to do the protest. Yes, they tried to delegitimize their, their protest and resistance, but at the same time they tried to tie it with something from outside. Because for the Taliban and their misogynistic ideology, women's right is not universal. In that context, dignity and equality is exclusively defined for men. They thought these women can't be a local voice and ask for the basic, um, uh, basic rights. And what makes it very different in context of Afghanistan is all these atrocities are happening systematically and institutionally. And it's enforced across the country by physical force against every single woman and girl in Afghanistan. And there is an office that oversees implementation of these 85 decrees you mentioned that limit and control women. Violating those, them, those decrees can lead to violence, imprisonment, torture, and even death. That's why they have established a system corresponding to apartheid. And it should be recognized as what it is. And that should be criminalized in Afghanistan. As we have heard today, banning girls from school is a fundamental component of gender apartheid. Nompendo, you fought to expand access to education. What is it about an educated girl that is so scary to men in power? Thank you so much, Malala, for that question, and greetings to everyone in the room. It's really an honor for me to be here with you all, and as we commemorate 10 years since the passing of Dr. Nelson Mandela, may his spirit continue to live on. Um, and thank you very much to the Nelson Mandela Foundation for reaching out to me to be part of a panel of such amazing women who, on a day-to-day -day basis, are leading for a just future in the various corners that they come from. Malala, I also want to thank you for sharing with us your story, and to you too, Mitra. Um, when I started preparing for, for this engagement, I was so excited to be sharing this platform with yourself because of our commonly shared passion for education. 
you ask the question, what makes people so obsessed about education? I mean, when I think of our country, um, we, from the days of fighting for the liberation of our people, declared in the Freedom Charter that the doors of learning and teaching should be open to all. When you look at the UN and Article 26, it says that there should be access to education for all, that education is a human right. When you look at South, Africa, South Africa's government and its commitment to education through its budget, I mean, the biggest portion of the budget of the South African government goes towards education. I think it's about 460 billion rand. I don't know how to translate that to dollars, but we could do that later. But ultimately, in most countries, education is either used to empower or in the case of Afghanistan, it's being used as a tool to disempower. It's being used as a tool to divide. It's being used as a tool to create an inferior uh, portion or uh, body of the country. This is not foreign. We've seen this in Nazi Germany. We've seen this in South Africa. Hendrik von Wurt created an act called Bantu Education, where it was ultimately aimed at ensuring that black women remained servants to white men and white people, that black men remained servants to big mining industries. Our fathers were stuck underground for hours and hours mining gold that they, they themselves could never ever buy for themselves. And that was intentional. It was intentional to ensure that black people are not actively participating in the economy, that black people are not leading society. I mean, he says that he, he didn't want to see greener pastures for us. That's exactly what I'm learning to understand is what is happening in Afghanistan. And so that is what makes education um, so powerful, not only to ensure the active participation of communities, right, through skills and knowledge, but also education helps you to shape and harness the thinking of communities, right? It, it helps you to... To, to teach communities what is right from wrong. It helps you to instill values and morals within communities that should be aligned to um, equality, that should be aligned to equity, to justice, to peace. That is what we should be teaching in our education system. Not what Hitler taught, where he was teaching people that they are more superior, they're an Aryan race to others. Not what is happening in Afghanistan, where women are being made to feel that they are lesser human beings. And that brings me to the why, for example, in our years of the student, of my, well, my years of student activism, um, why we had such a great focus on access to education, not only for, for all, but with a sp particular focus on women, on young women. In South Africa, Malala, we appreciate that under the apartheid regime, we, held, we had triple oppression, right? Where there was oppression along the lines of race, of class, and of gender. And today, as young black South African women, when we acknowledge the challenges we experience, we acknowledge them as a young black working class woman. So the age element makes it, I don't know what, quadruple oppression? That's what we experience. And so we've had to be very intentional about the type of policies we put in place that can protect young women. We fought for free education, and today, young people who come from households with an income bracket of 350,000 rand and below, and I did check how much that is in dollars, uh, I think it's about $19,000. So young people who come from those income brackets get to go to school or tertiary for free in South Africa. And that's been intentional. It's been intentional that we say young girls in schools must have sanitary dignity, so they must have sanitary towels. We've been intentional to say the Department of Social Development in South Africa must cater for households that are led by children and must support them because out of the five children in the household, if four are boys and one is a girl, the one who's going to have to sacrifice going to school is most probably going to be the girl child. So in order for us to see women participate in the economy, become leaders of society, we've had to be intentional about their inclusion in education as that has a ripple effect into their participation in the economy and society. Fully agree on that. Education is powerful and uh, 
in order to ensure that we keep challenging patriarchy, we have to invest in women and girls' education. Now I would uh, discuss more gender apartheid as a concept, as a law. I'm not um, a lawyer, but I am an activist. So it would be good to talk about gender apartheid to a legal expert. And I would love to talk to Karima on this because she is the legal expert that we're looking for here. Why is it important to codify gender apartheid? Thank you so much for this question, Malala, and for your support for Afghan women who are leading the global call for the recognition of gender apartheid. And I have to say that it's very humbling to be on this stage. It's very humbling to be discussing apartheid before an audience that knows better than anyone in the world what that means and just how difficult it is to challenge. And allow me also to say personally, as the granddaughter of an Algerian peasant leader who was killed by colonial forces while taking part in Algeria's liberation struggle, that it is a profound honor to be at this event honoring Madiba's legacy. And this really brings me back to your question, Malala, because I see the same courage and commitment my Algerian grandfather showed fighting colonialism in the fight by Afghan women today against unjust Taliban rule. The good news is that many UN officials and experts have correctly condemned the grave violations that Mitra so eloquently described as gender apartheid, including the UN Secretary General himself. The UN Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan has also used this term, called on the world to end it, and explained that it is an institutionalized system of discrimination, segregation, humiliation, and exclusion of women and girls. Countries, governments from many regions have joined this call. And I'm glad to say, and I say with tremendous gratitude, that South Africa did this in the UN Human Rights Council in June, both recognizing that the situation in Afghanistan constitutes gender apartheid, but also calling on the world to take effective steps to end it, akin to those steps taken to help end de jure apartheid in South Africa. This was a landmark act of human rights leadership, and we have to call on the international community to heed those words, to go beyond condemnation, and take concerted effective action to end this systematic oppression. What has been tried since the Taliban took power isn't working. And I think, along with many Afghan women, I believe that gender apartheid is one of the most promising options for a way forward. So what does that mean legally? What are the consequences of using the apartheid framing in this context? Well, adapted from the international law on racial apartheid, gender apartheid emphasizes that discrimination has actually become the system of government. It's the entire aim of governance. The apartheid framework then tells us that the ordinary human rights approach that really expects the state to lead on human rights issues can't work here. The only way positive change can happen is with a consistent and principled international response. So one of the most powerful aspects of the apartheid framework is that it clarifies the legal obligations of other states to take effective action to end this illegal situation. And I must say that South Africans know better than anyone else in the world the abject moral failure that so-called constructive engagement with apartheid represents. This is what Afghan women like Mitra and her colleagues are watching in horror now, increasing attempts by some international actors to normalize the Taliban despite their repressive policies, while Afghan women continue to risk their lives to demand equality. That should really outrage us. That is not acceptable. And so a gender apartheid approach would mean, as was the case with racial apartheid in South Africa, that it is not legal for any state to be complicit with the Taliban's illegal actions. There can be no recognition of the Taliban, at least until they end their system of gender apartheid. To end, let me say, this month is very special, both because of the sad anniversary today and also because of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
Afghan women are the bravest defenders of the Declaration's principles, including equality, some of the bravest in the world. So now is an essential time, not next year, not some other time. Now is an essential time to stand with them by ending gender apartheid. It is a time to fulfill Madiba's prophecy, a powerful statement that he made on the day he left prison, when he said, apartheid has no future. Now it is up to all of us to make sure that prophecy comes true.